Hello everyone and good morning to all of you who are joining us from Asia. We are having alumni today joining us from so many different countries including China, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, India, Philippines and many many more places and I lost track of all of them. And I'm really excited to have this global audience because I really, uh, this is a great opportunity to reach out to all of you and to showcase one of the rising stars of the faculty that we have at Kellogg. So I'm actually delighted to be able to introduce Professor Dashun Wang, who is who's joined Kellogg in 2016, and he's already, you know, he's, he's making a very, very fast career, and he's already Associate Professor of Management and Organization at Kellogg, and he has also an appointment at the McCormick School of uh, Engineer. And uh, uh, it's, it's also, a, he's, he's really opening a new and exciting area. He is the founding director of the Center for Science of Science in the Innovation. He has a, a PhD in physics. Actually, is one of the example, when I first joined uh, uh, Kellogg and I gave my acceptance speech, I said, how one of the things that attracted me at Kellogg was how eclectic the faculty was, that they were game theorists and, uh, uh, you know, development economics. And then I said that there are even physicists. I have no idea what they're doing, but apparently there are physicists at Kellogg. And then I actually met Dashun Wang and I discovered what he was doing and I thought it was extremely interesting. Because really science of science is a really an emerging area it's a multi multidisciplinary field that really unlocks the science behind innovation. And, and this is such an amazing uh, new field that, and that the Shun has published in Nature, in Science, in some of the most forward uh, publications. And, and I recently, because I said this has done a, such a stellar career, was recently um, promoted I was uh, he doesn't know that but I was reading all the letter of recommendation it was amazing there was someone who said there is a buzz going around as you can see I memorized it because it remained in my mind there's a buzz going around in the academics about Professor Wang and there was another one saying science of science is the future and Kelleg is leading it thanks to Professor Wang so I'm really delighted that uh, he's, uh, he's accepted uh, to come here and he's going to start talking about uh, that. And thank you, Dashun. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, that is overly kind. Thank you so much, Francesca, for a great introduction. Uh, let me now start sharing my screen uh, and just bear with me for a second. And uh, I'm sharing. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I am the recovering physicist uh, at Kellogg. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all. Good morning to many of you uh, joining us from Asia. Uh, I'm very excited to share a few things we have been doing lately. And also if time allows in the end, I also wanna share uh, some uh, very brand new ventures we've been trying to think about also. It's gonna be actually the first time I ever talk about this in public. So I'm also very excited about this. As Francesca mentioned, uh, in 2019, with the help and from, uh, very strong support from the Dean's Office and many of my colleagues at Kellogg, I helped launch the new Kellogg Center for Science of Science and Innovation, the first center worldwide dedicated to the emerging field of the science of science. This center builds on Kellogg's long-standing long tradition of excellence in this area and helps bring together faculty across Kellogg and Northwestern to cement our global thought leadership position in the field. With time, we also hope to contribute to the curriculum development in the area while positioning ourselves to best understand, anticipate, and respond to new challenges in this rapidly evolving innovation landscapes. And I'm also glad actually to report, you know, within a year since launching 2020, we have also recently been uh, recognized by some awards such as AACSB 2020 innovation that inspire and fast companies world changing ideas this year. So 
what is science of science? Let me spend one minute of the shortest intro that I can think of. Uh, there is a very new field, as Francesca mentioned, and indeed 2018, I would argue, is a very exciting time for the field, starting 2018, because that's the year we first published our first review paper of the field called Science of Science in Science. Uh, later that year, science uh, actually uh, put together a special issue, uh, launch a special issue again and put us on the cover of science. At the same time, later this year, November 2020, we're also looking forward to the first book of the field that's going to be published in November 2020. And I'm also very glad and fortunate to be involved in all this, uh, uh, all this uh, effort to help build out the field further. So in, in many ways, turning the idea of turning the scientific methods and curiosities on the scientific ecosystem itself. This idea is not new. This idea dates back to at least the mid 20th century. To, uh, my, there are several founding scholars of the field, such as Robert Morton, uh, the great sociologist of science, to think about the idea of Matthew effect, singletons and multiples, or the Sala Price, think about the, which is a physicist turned historian, think about the idea of power law, invisible college, community advantage, or Harriet Zuckerman, her uh, very canonical work on Nobel laureates, or Thomas Kuhn, which is another physicist turned historian, thinking about the idea of paradigm shift. So in many ways, I think what we are trying to do in this emerging multidisciplinary community is to stand on the shoulders of these giants, but then take two things that they did not have the luxury to have in their time. The first is the increasing availability of large scale data sets that twist the entirety of the scientific enterprise, help, uh, helping us capture its workings at an unprecedented level of scale and detail. Second, the parallel development in fields like network science, data science, and artificial intelligence over the past decades offer us a wide range of tools that help us make sense of this data with growing accuracy and robustness. Together, they tell a complex yet insightful story about how innovative careers unfold, how collaborations come together and contribute to discovery, and how scientific progress emerges through multiple interdependent factors. And often, they also have the direct implications for entrepreneurship as well as sustainable business innovations. So I thought I, what I would do today with the short time we have together is to just give you two studies and uh, that has been recently published to give you a flavor of what kind of work we're pursuing, the original research we're doing. And now I wanna share some uh, next steps we're also exploring, some very explorative ideas, okay? So this first study I wanna think about is to talk about the latest advances on team science. So uh, this actually builds on the research actually was produced at Kellogg before I joined. Uh, and it was done by uh, two of my colleagues, Brian Woodsy and Ben Jones in a paper, a canonical paper in the field published in 2007, where they documented a remarkable fact that is one of the most universal shifts in science and technology today is the growth of large teams in all areas of research as solitary researchers and small teams diminish. And the, one of the greatest example of this is the detection of gravitational waves, commonly known as the discovery of the 21st century, which won the Nobel Prize two years within the discovery. As a recurring physicist, people say, I tend to get overly excited when I talk about this, but allow me to be a little nerdy for a second, is to think about, you know, how did we detect the two black holes that collided a billion years ago and radiated the small gravitational waves over to the Earth and were able to detect uh, a very, very tiny uh, variation. And how tiny is that you look at the apparatus here, is the two tunnels that are four kilometers long, housed in ultra high vacuum. The goal is to detect a variation that's a trillionth of an inch. So certainly this is a feat that no small teams or individuals can ever hope to pull off. So part of, for this reason, the growth and dominance of large teams has become a uh, simple, has turned from a simple phenomenon to a simple prescription, is that if you are faced with a small and large teams, you should go with the larger teams. But at the same time, there are also reasons to believe that large teams may not be optimized for innovation. 
because large teams such as large or business organizations may focus on short bets with large potential markets, whereas small teams that have more to gain and less to lose may undertake new untested opportunities. Therefore, this led me to wonder whether small and large teams differ in the character of work they produce. So we start to test this hypothesis across three, dif three different domains, collecting large scale, scale data set from three different settings. First is the journal publications and citations of those publications from 44 million papers. Second is about 5 million patents published by the U U United States Patent Office. And the third one is about 16 million software projects published on GitHub. Across all these three different domains, we try to measure the character of work by using a pre-existing method to think about to measure the disruptiveness of our work. Broadly speaking, this is to measure, to assess how much a given work destabilizes this field and eclipses the prior state of art that they build up. Let me give you an example. Basically, the measure is trying to say, for all the future work that build on this work, how much of this future work also reference the work that this, this uh, focal work is referencing. Let me give you an example. What do you see over here is a BTW model paper, which is a very famous physics paper that launched a new field called self-organized criticality. But you see this paper and the citations of the paper, you see all the papers that cite this paper only cite this paper alone without referencing any paper that this paper cites. So what you show here is that BTW model, what you say here is that completely eclipsed everything that came before and created a new direction of inquiry. In contrast, this paper by Davis et al. won the Nobel Prize in physics for empirically validating both Einstein condensation. This paper has roughly the similar number of citations as the BTW model paper. But the difference is that for every paper that cites this paper, they also references the paper that this paper cites uh, uh, before. So what this means is that while they have the same level of impact, that impact for this paper is different in that this paper elaborated pre-existing pre pre hypothesis. So that leads us to wonder across all the three domains we want to look at, how does this disruption uh, changes with team size? And what we all observe is a nearly universal pattern. You see across the three domains, when you look at the red curve, which measures the impact of work uh, each team produces, we find we confirm the pre prior, work, uh, prior research in the field that as team grows larger and larger, the product they produce tend to garner higher and higher impact. But if you look at a disruption index we measured, and what you see is a green curve they systematically decreases with team size. So what this suggests is that whereas large teams tended to develop and further existing ideas and designs, their smaller counterparts are the ones who tended to disrupt current, current way of thinking with new ideas, inventions, and opportunities. In other words, large teams excel at solving problems, but it is the small teams that are more likely to come up with the new problems for their more sizable counterparts to solve. This brings us to a full circle of the gravitational wave example, which is, well, LIGO, the gravitation, detectional gravitational wave, was the discovery of the 21st century. It was a careful demonstration of a prior hypothesis. It was built to validate the discovery of the 20th century, proposed exactly 100 years before. In November 1915, when the Prussia Academy of Science first heard the highly disruptive theory of general relativity, it was made by a single author, namely Albert Einstein, the ultimate small team. So the idea of gravitational waves and their measurements both moved the science forward, but they do so in very different ways. Now, some may raise the question of whether this is really the small versus large teams, or could it be explained by other confounding factors, such as a disciplinary difference, topic difference, or people who tend to engage with small or large teams, they are also different. What we find is that while these factors may account some of the relationship, the vast majority of the relationship we, we observe do can be attributed to both uh, to the team size itself. 
So what this tells us is while small teams can drive, uh, so what this tells us is basically one sentence I summarize here is that both small and large teams are essential to a flourishing ecology of science and technology. While small teams can drive disruption and innovation, large teams can pick up the ball and engage with a greater development of a given area as part of a vicious circle. These ideas also apply to business as well as my daily uh, practice as I'm leading teams uh, in a daily basis. Because uh, over time, uh, for a while I tend to think, uh, when I put together a team to tackle a challenge, you know, why not add one more person to a team? You know, it may not help, but at least it doesn't hurt, right? So our research instead suggests that this is not true. Creating large teams, it dep well, the answer is really depends on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Creating large teams likely shift the focus and outcome from disruptive to developmental. So for the most innovative project that seek to disrupt the field and move the needle dramatically, one perhaps should consider how to shrink the size of the team. So the bottom line, the takeaway of the first study is bigger is not always better. And figuring out the right team size for the job may be the first question for tomorrow's leaders to answer to unlock the true potential of their enterprises. And we're also very grateful to be able to publish this paper in Nature and grateful that Nature put us on their cover to highlight this discovery. And also in 2020, we recently learned that this paper actually was ranked within top 100 most discussed papers of all sciences in 2019. So, and that's the first study I wanna share. I wanna explore now, shift my attention to the second study uh, I wanted to talk about today, which is a, a new direction we have been exploring lately. Uh, you know, in many ways over the past of several years, many of our work can be summarized in terms of understanding the factors uh, uh, related to success, in terms of successful individuals, successful ideas, successful products, or successful companies. And so you can see this slides here, I've been staring at them for many, many years and try to learn the secrets behind them. But as I look at them more and more, I realize I'm, I'm looking at the trees but missing the forest here. Because the main, the key question here is that out of all these people, for each one of the J.K. Rowling, there are thousands, if not millions of the other people who also aspire to do the same. Also, even for J.K. Rowling herself, because before she is someone, she was, she was somebody, she was nobody. So before she was a success, she was in many ways in her own terms, was a failure as well. So that makes me realize actually for our understanding in this area, there is a big open question is to understand failure. So that's why I directed my group over the past this, uh, two to three years to actually tackle this question very scientific, in the scientific lens. And over the years, we have been learning actually a lot about this. And for example, so these are just two simple sample questions we now, we recently provided new answers to. First is to think about, are there impending signals in failures that eventually lead to success? And are there things we can learn from failures that can help us succeed sooner? What are they and how? And second question is to think about, the consequence of failures. Do failure matter? And what's the consequence of early failure on long-term career outcome? And these are the two papers we recently published, including one in, the, uh, in Nature, in the 150 years anniversary issue of Nature. What I'm gonna present to you is uh, for the interest of time today, I'm gonna only talk about as, uh, the second question is to think about the consequence of failures. How much does it matter if you fail early in your career? And I'm gonna focus on one specific type of failure that has fascinated me for as long as I can remember, which is near miss. Near miss is the kind of failure that you're almost, but didn't quite make it. So, and obviously happens everywhere in sports, but it also happens everywhere in life, if you think about it. So that makes me wonder, you know, when a near miss happens, how much of a difference does it make in the future? So the opportunity came along when NIH, or National Institute of Health, which is the largest funder for biomedical research in the world, came to us and offered us all their data sets, allowing us to examine 
uh, more than 700,000 competing grant proposals to the NIH, spanning over 35 years. And to, uh, so, the, in my, and so what we're gonna look in the study is to focus on young P scientists only, the junior PIs who are starting out their life within three years. And the, uh, what we're gonna focus on is the specific group is that with the way NIH funds uh, proposals is by scoring all the proposals and fund each one by one based on that score. So what that creates is this arbitrary cutoff point where you know, the people who are just above the line and below the line are basically what economists call identical twins. They're basically the same as each other. Yet, so that's what we call the narrow winners and near misses. Uh, these are all the same kind of scientists. In many ways, they're the same, same people all starting out their career. Yet after that day, there's a big difference between them. The narrow winners now have a million dollars for the next five years to pursue the research they propose. A near misses at that point had nothing. So that makes me wonder the specific question I want to think about is, yes, success and failure happens sometimes randomly in life, but let's not to be hung up on that one incident. Let's think into the future. Imagine 10 years later, these two people come back for a job interview. Who would you hire? So that's the question I wanted to explore. Imagine you look at their CVs in the next 10 years. Who do you think will perform better? So this is a very naive question in many ways because this question has a well-established answer and very simple answer is that you should hire the one who succeeded. The basic logic is that even if the two individuals are basically the same, but rich gets richer, winning begets more winnings and nothing succeed like success. So the, even if they were the same, the winners will gradually set himself or herself apart from the losers over time. So what we wanted to do is simply measure how, how, how well these uh, two innovators, two researchers did in terms of the publications they produced in the next five years. And what I'm gonna use to measure is the ISO standard in my field is to calculate the heat paper probability, is to think about out of all the papers you published, how many of them ended up being the heat paper defined as top 5% citations in the same field and year. What do you see is that the narrow winners, the blue guys, they uh, in the next five years published hit papers about 13%. So much, much higher than the baseline 5% rate in their field. So what this shows is that, you know, getting an NIH grant is, not a, is no walk in the park. So these people are much, much better than their peers. On the other hand, near misses, if you look at their papers in the next five years, you see they published hit papers about a 16%. In the next five years, from year six to year 10, these two groups uh, basically maintain the same difference. And uh, if you summarize the results between, uh, for the next 10 years, you see a big gap between these two, where orange group uh, produced a paper with much, much higher impact. But wait, orange group actually are the ones who fail. So what this is suggesting is a paradoxically, near misses systematically outperform narrow winners in the future. So when I saw this results, I was like, this can't be right. There must be something is wrong. So I basically worked my, with my postdoc to, vary it, uh, to create any variation of measurements we can think of. And every time we vary the measurements, we find the exactly the same conclusion. If you look at the number of papers these two groups publish, as shown in the plot here, you see the two groups publish roughly the same number of papers in like 10 years. So what these results now start to show us is that near misses had fewer initial grants, yet they ultimately published as many papers, and most surprisingly produced work that garnered substantially higher impact. So now it raises the question of what is going on here? So one common hypothesis here is called a screening hypothesis. It goes something like this, is that early career failure is of consequence. So therefore, when failure happens, and some people are more likely to leave the system all by themselves uh, 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 entirely. So that means even though you start with these two groups, when failure happens, it creates a differential attrition rate across the two groups, so that now near miss group actually have fewer people left. And this is indeed empirically validated uh, in the data set. 
uh, when you look at the two groups, you see immediately after the treatment, that unfortunate event happens, there's a 10% difference in terms of attrition rate. This result, by the way, when I present this to the NIH director, Francis Collins, is scared uh, them a lot, very much. And uh, so they actually, because of this result, build a new working group to think about how do we nurture, how do they nurture junior, junior career scientists. But for our own purpose, it does raise a competing hypothesis, is this quick versus great hypothesis. The idea is simple, is to say, well, is this because near misses perform better? Is it because they actually have fewer people left? So that it's just a better half of the population that we made? Or these people actually become a better version of themselves? In other words, is this a survival of the fittest? Or is actually what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? And in this paper, one contribution of this paper is that we're actually able to do a conservative estimation of the competing evidence and actually provide the amount of first empirical evidence that documents this idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Let me quickly rewire and think about what we have talked about in the second study, which basically summarized into four sentences. First, we find that a near, uh, early career near miss in science has powerful opposing effects. On one hand, it significantly increased attrition. Yet on the other hand, for those who manage to stay in, near misses systematically outperform narrow wins in the long run as their publications in the next 10 years garnered substantially higher impact. And lastly, we now observed the amount of first empirical evidence of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We have a recent ongoing and follow-up work actually confirmed this effect across three different settings uh, using three different empirical strategies. So we're very glad to be the ones that first discover this kind of effect of failure. For the interest of time, I, I do not have the time to actually go through all the studies uh, that we have been uh, working on. So uh, you have to, uh, hope, unfortunately have to refer to our uh, websites and the different uh, uh, documents of uh, the list of uh, uh, publications. Here I'm only listing several of the papers by the faculty at the CSSI, our center, to think about uh, you know, uh, the work we have been doing over the, over the years. And uh, for the interest of space here, I can only list it for two journals, but keep in mind, we do publish in other journals. And uh, we are also fortunate that many of the uh, work we do uh, also uh, seem to speak to a broad audience. So we're also very gratified that this is a, a media coverage uh, within a year as an example to, to think about the worldwide media uh, attention to the original research that we produce. We're also gratified to learn that in 2019, CSSI generated 88% of media attention score of all catalog faculty. And some of this work, we're also gratified to learn that some of the journals actually de decided to um, put us on the cover to highlight. Here are a few examples. And feel free to reach out to me anytime if you want to learn more about any of the studies. And obviously, none of these are possible without very strong support from my dean's office, as well as several ex uh, external funders including the Minerva Initiative, which funded as part of the launching grant, funded $5 million uh, recently to our school, and as well as all other funders, including our Alfred, uh, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, NIH, NSF, Air Force, uh, AF, OSR in the Department of Defense, were very grateful for all this generous support. And in many ways, this makes us uh, feel, you know, we are very, we feel very fortunate to be able to produce uh, all this work, but now it makes us wonder what can we do with all this new support that we have. So it makes us really look forward to the future. So now for the remaining three, two to three minutes, I want to talk about the question of uh, one of the futures we are exploring. So this is the, for the first time, for the record, this is the, uh, for the first time I'm speaking about this new venture in public. So I'm very interested that actually this is a particular group I want to share about this initiative. So I want, I'm very excited about this. Please feel free to reach out to me if you want to talk more. So to think about what's next, I want to talk about first a simple fact that people don't seem to talk a lot about. 
Okay, so here I'm listing two simple, uh, two example countries. You can do this exercise for every country. Here is China and the US. And I went to Wikipedia and look up what is the population size between these two countries. And you see these two numbers. And what, so if I did a simple ratio, this is about a four to one ratio. There are four times more Chinese uh, population than uh, the US. Okay, so one, uh, genetically speaking, given this number, one simple implication of this number is that when it comes to innovators like Thomas Edison or Marie Curie of the world, statistically speaking, you should be expecting roughly four to one ratio of people who have the potential to become a Thomas Edison or Marie Curie. Although that makes me curious, to look up another Wikipedia page of the number of Nobel laureates in, the, uh, in these two countries. And here are the numbers. Uh, United States has 383 Nobel laureates, whereas China had only eight. So that's a simple math of one versus 210. So what this suggests then is for every Thomas Edison or Marie Curie, at least 200 of them are missing, and this is a vastly under uh, this vastly conservative underestimation, and this fact makes me wonder more. Now let's take this logic a little further, because this fact hits home a very deeply at a very personal level. Let me give you a personal story I recently had. This is the place I work, and I'm sure Francesca can tell you, and I confirm, is the best place in the world. If you haven't been to this building, please come back, visit us soon. So I was showing this picture in the context of the other day that ABC actually recently has decided to produce a documentary, to, to produce a movie, a documentary, to document the journey of science of science. So that part of the starring is yours truly here speaking. So I was showing the producer and the, uh, the director of where I work. So that's, they're planning the filming of the documentary. And then the producer asked me, hey, can you show me actually where you grew up? Where was the school that you went to? And that makes me wonder, that's a good question. Let me do a Google search. After 20 minutes of Google search, I found only one picture that I can find. And this is where I grew up. And this is the only picture I can find. And this is my school. I can see my classroom right there. And when, you, when the producer saw this picture, you can see their, her eyes light up, right? This is an amazing story. We have to go to where you grew up and film from there and to see the whole journey. And then I realized we're wrong because that's not the real story. The real story is for every one of me that exists, there are thousands, if not millions of people who have a more potential to actually do what I do but they did not have the opportunity to do so. So this makes me wonder a new venture that I've been exploring with a small team of mine is to think about, can we then apply everything that we have learned over the past few years in science of science, but apply it to help young innovators in developing countries to realize their full potential, creative potential by drastically improving access to opportunities and creating radically new conditions for innovation, you know, so that those who can succeed will. So we're at the very beginning of this journey and we have, uh, we have identified a few initial test cases and we're actually looking in this case uh, for any uh, people who are enthusiastic about this venture to join us in this exciting journey. For example, our initial focus area is in fact in South and East Asia initial focus population is on early career researchers and entrepreneurs. And the initial tax area we want to test is how to help them succeed is in terms of what are the role of collaboration? What's the role of social network? What is the role of access to opportunity? Or what is the role of mentorship? I think the bottom line is this. 21st century economy is driven by innovation. But if we fail to identify, develop, and nurture those with true creative potential, then society as a whole will suffer. So we're at the very beginning of this journey. And please contact me, reach out anytime. And I'm listing my uh, email here, as well as my WeChat account, that you can also uh, add me on WeChat to chat more, if you would like. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And we'll be opening up for uh, discussions. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dashun. Uh, please uh, put in the questions and I'll start asking. There's a few that started coming in when you were talking about uh, uh, the, the, the one on the near miss, your paper on near misses. And one is asking, how do you measure innovation that ahead of the market? Oh, that's a very, very good question. How do you measure innovation that's ahead of the market? Uh, so uh, this actually, let me do a plug of a uh, great work by my colleague uh, is to think about the, uh, you know, what kind of innovation uh, tend to be a, a home run innovation. And this is a joint work by my colleague, Brian Wuzi and Ben Jones. Let me use their work as an example. So we all know that uh, for innovation, it's important to be novel. So novelty is the key here. But their discovery is in fact to show that, you know, the reason mining innovations that seem, appear to be a great idea in the beginning, but ended up being a flop in the market, is actually precisely because, not because of their innovation, but the lack of conventionality. So their work actually showed us, I, I, in, this is one of my favorite work, is to think about this idea that uh, for a innovation to be a hit innovation, both novelty and conventionality matters. So the innovation has to be a atypical knowledge that's rarely seen combined before, but deeply grounded in the conventional thinking. So this is kind of the innovation that tend to be the home run innovation. Okay, and always in that direction, there's another one that says, what a near misses looks like in business. For example, startups, the successful unicorns versus those of last one year, how, how do you, measure any misses in the in business well, very very good question so uh we've been actually studying it and we in fact recently filed a patent on this i don't know if francesca knows about i didn't it. know that <laughs> uh, uh, uh to think about how do we identify startups uh, uh that are failing but will succeed in the future for example so that's the gist of the patent disclosure uh, by analyzing the pattern data. So here, you know, one example of near miss uh, in business is to think about the, uh, the kind of a startup that has to close the shop the day before the next funding round can be closed. You know, and, and you know, that will be uh, several recent actually high profile examples, including a venture from MIT Media Lab. Actually, this is what happens. It's precisely the night before they are able to close the next round of funding. Uh, you know, they had to, you know, send everybody home. So, you know, that will be uh, one example of near miss. But obviously, you know, there's a near miss and there's not so near miss, but it's also a failure. So there's a whole spectrum of type of failure, depends on how you think about. So everybody has a different tolerance in terms of how the definition of how close they are. But one study we recently did, which was published uh, in Nature and it's a separate study, is to take this idea further. Let me just elaborate on that, is to think about in the startup world, there are a lot more failures than success. But one not uh, somewhat overlooked the fact is that before you actually succeed, you have to fail. Many people have to fail many, many times. What we're discovering recently is that if you actually analyze how people fail over and over and eventually succeed, there are actually statistical patterns that you can actually detect to see before they eventually succeed. They are showing certain patterns of improvement that's indicative of their future success. So this speaks to the idea that every winner starts as a loser, but if we actually study how they lose over and over, we can actually predict whether they will win or not while they're still losing. So that's just a, a plug of another idea we've been exploring. Very nice. And um, here is a question regarding your paper on the team side. It says, for today's innovation, what is the ideal number of team size for new business and for established business? When should you, sh when should you know when to make uh, your uh, team larger? That's a, another a great question. Jeff Bezos has a great line that uh, this is called a two pizzas rule. 
So his point is that if a meeting can't be fed by two pizzas, then it's too big. Uh, and uh, it speaks to this idea, but it's, uh, I would say, slightly off in the sense that you want to think about two pizzas, but two small size pizzas here. So uh, the idea here and the results we show here is that there's in fact no magic number, you say below five or below four, there is no magic number like that. For every team size you increase, every additional member tends to decrease the disruptiveness of the team, you know? And, and you know, if you shrink teams smaller, they tend to be more disruptive. So there's kind of a continuous, continuous scale here. So one example, I think what the way to think about this is to think about what Apple did, what Steve Jobs did when he was trying to develop iPhone. You know, the way he did it was not about the uh, entire organization start working on iPhone. The way he did it was to create the secret building, move people separately, create this small team to test this idea because it's a very disruptive and new idea. So that's where you need a small team to test it away from all the typical big teams. Once you see the success, uh, potential for success of that project, that's where you want a big, large team to come in to actually develop this idea further and build out this idea. So this is a very common, uh, in some ways, misconception as we're getting a lot of media attention is that everybody was calling me, oh, so you are, you are saying small teams is the way to go. You're killing our big teams, but that's not what we're saying. What I have been saying is that the conclusion is that both small and large teams are important because they both move the science and technology forward, but they do so in a different way. So to ensure a flourishing ecology of the ecosystem, you need both small and large teams. And actually there's a related question. What is the force behind the increasing team size in recent years? So that's a very good question too. So this, I, this trend, the research has studied this, and this trend has been, has been attributed to several different factors. Uh, the first factor is to think about the uh, growing knowledge demand uh, on scientists. The idea, this is the idea actually proposed by my colleague Ben Jones, also here at Kellogg, it's called a burden of knowledge. So the idea is that you know, we have more and more research produced. So if you want to stand on a soldier for giants and the giants grows taller and taller, so it takes a lot more time to actually climb the back of giants. So this means, uh, you know, individuals are being more and more specialized while problems being more and more complex. So individuals have to team up. You know, that's one prevailing hypothesis for behind the trend of the team size increase. But another equally promising uh, hypothesis is to think about you know, the uh, reduced cost in terms of air travels or you know, the interconnectivity of the world, as well as some expensive experimental equipment such as LHC, the Large Hydrogen Collider in uh, Geneva, uh, where concentrated all the physicists because that's the only particle uh, accelerator there is, uh, facilitated larger and larger uh, collaborations. And here is a question. Uh, given the recent deglobalization and decoupling of US and China, how does this impact the cross functional collaboration? Will this slow down disruption or accelerate it? Uh, great question again. Uh, we actually. That's which is all Kellogg alumni. Kellogg <laughs> alumni are the best. They have great questions. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, we, um, with this is actually a, a re very recent work we have been doing, is especially in the context of COVID-19. We wanted to understand how COVID-19 has affected scientists. In fact, a quick plot, we actually have a paper first coming this week in Nature Human Behavior to present the first empirical evidence to think about the role of COVID-19 on the scientific workforce. And as you can see, the picture here is an artist's uh, recreate my life during COVID-19 uh, to think about, uh, you know, staying at home. What we're finding, uh, the research is suggesting in terms of the current China, uh, US in particular, there are a couple of trends that's worth noting. The first one is to think about international collaboration. If you look at during COVID, in fact, between China and the US, international collaboration actually increased. The reason is because 
you know, China is the one that really had the first data on COVID-19. So they're the one that actually calls out uh, all the international collaborations to work with them. And there's a very strong response in the scientific community in thinking about producing new, new innovations related to COVID-19. So for the time being, international collaboration between US and China actually increased and they're actually being published in very, very high profile journals for the reasons that you know, COVID-19 is a, such a timely and novel and consequential topic. Now, second trend to keep in mind here is to think about what happens, will happen in the next few years. Uh, this is where we elaborated in our paper as well, uh, is to, to think about, uh, you know, what COVID is creating right now is a, uh, is a clear disruption in international travels. So what this means is that scholars who study East Asia will not be able to travel to field sites in, from the US. It also means that the students will not be easily to cross the national boundary either. So the long-term effect, potential effect, is this may actually deeply alter the scientific capability of different nations for years to come. So this will be another very dominating factor. And I think the entire uh, uh, scientific uh, enterprise in the US in particular, in both institutional leaders like Francesca, as well as policymakers on the Capitol Hills, have been actually thinking uh, very deeply about this issue. And some of the uh, initial insights were coming from our paper that are reporting the empirical evidence that helped inform this debate is to think about how do we rebuild the global research enterprise following COVID-19. Actually, given that you mentioned uh, COVID-19 uh, related, right? So given all this talk about scientists collaborating that we see with COVID-19, do you see the COVID-19 crisis permanently changing the way science is conducted or not? Uh, it will definitely change a lot of the things. And I think everyone is trying to work through you know, what's the most likely uh, scenario. And obviously this depends on, uh, you know, how each country contains COVID-19, which I will not have the time to elaborate for the situations in the US today. Uh, but, you know, this will depend on actually a lot of different factors. And I think one thing people start to realize is uh, to think about the crucial importance of innovation, right? So the idea is to think about uh, you know, right now we're taking, what COVID-19 did was to essentially uh, take a abrupt halt in everything we have been doing in the economy, the entire world locked down all of a sudden, right? So what that creates is this very strong tension between public health and the economic health. And the, the way to think about this is to think about the importance of innovation is that if you can actually produce the innovation that helps us reduce the pain in either the public health or the economic health, the benefits will be enormous. So every investment in innovation, in innovation, well, always seems like a large number when the countries describe and debate about a budget uh, every year, all of a sudden seems tiny in terms of the GDP losses related to uh, the, the global pandemic that we're experiencing. Okay, and there's another question going to your last uh, point that you did. This is excellent presentation, which I agree. Uh, on the initiative of encouraging innovation in Asia and China, isn't there a strong cultural factor? For example, many Asian culture highly emphasize conformity and punish failures. How can we overcome this when it is embedded in the system? So, uh... That, that's a great one question, but I was thinking it's two-fold question. Uh, you know, one question is how do we overcome it? But I think uh, there is a question before that is, you know, is there a way to, you know, can we overcome it? For example, I think the first, uh, first thing we were trying to think about in terms of the initial project is what if we do a very scientific rigorous, in a scientific rigorous manner, to conduct a randomized control experiment on the different kind of innovators to think about if there is a cultural element to this issue as a barrier for succeed. And if we can actually somewhat, somewhat alleviate this barrier, you know, would it improve the situation or not? 
I think even for a question as simple as that, we don't have the answer. That's, that's sort of illustrates how much, how little actually, in fact, we know about how do you encourage people to innovate more. So these are the initial evidence we're hoping to gather in the next year or so. Uh, so that's why we're very interested in terms of local partnership uh, to actually think through all these different initiatives. And uh, once we have some empirical results, then we'll be able to inform uh, in a more informed manner for policies or uh, different decision makers to think about the question of how. This is great. This is just shows exactly how, how important these questions are and the study you're doing, right? It's really the essential of driving innovation. Here, there's someone else who says, thank you for your valuable lesson, le session. Is there any study about multiple work slash innovation done in parallel, like Da Vinci did across the different domains and achieved excellence in each domain? So it's a different, um, so just clarify. So I think if there's any, anybody who studied, um, it's like Da Vinci that did, did research in different domains, right? And did innovation. So I, I guess uh, the, the question is, are other people who, like, is there an advantage, I guess, some people who, if they are good in innovation or do it in uh, yeah. different uh, fields at all? Uh, Certainly, certainly. Uh, gr another great question makes me wonder, maybe you have read one of our papers. Uh, we, in <laughs> fact, this was uh, one of the papers produced by us uh, in 2018 in the Journal of Nature, where we discovered uh, for uh, artists, film we studied artists, film directors, and scientists. We analyzed as many of them we can find of their overall careers. And we wanted to see whether there are successful signals within this career. What we find is that uh, this idea of house tricks is that every creative individual have this period where they tend to produce one hit work after another in a close succession within four to five years period of their career. So, and this period seems to be very, very ubiquitous. Almost 90% of people have it and it seems to be rather unique. Most people have just one period. So this speaks to you in terms of Einstein's 1905, which is called in physics, called a miracle year, where he first produced uh, the understanding of Brownian motion, which uh, shows the existence of molecules. Then talk about the photoelectric effect, which launched the field of quantum mechanics. And then he talked about uh, you know, the idea of E equals to MC square, which is the most famous equation on earth. So, uh, so he produced a several fundamental paper change in physics. So that's a clear signal of multiples. There are all different directions, although not as uh, really varied as Da Vinci, but it does exist. So the conclusion right now is that it, the great people do tend to produce multiple times great works and this work tends to be temporarily localized and clustered within a short period of time. This is phenomenal. I'm getting inundated with questions in the meantime, but we are running out of time. Let me ask you a question that kind of summarizes several uh, here that is about exactly a lot of now coming up about, uh, you know, the COVID and what we are learning and uh, where, how it will impact. But, from your point of view, right, as someone who studies how science is done, what do you wish the non-scientists, including the general public, policymakers, understood about the scientific process? What do we all have to keep in mind? Uh, great question. Thank you. So I, I think the number one issue I have been thinking lately is to uh, realize this idea that science takes time. You know, when COVID happens, everybody is asking, when can we have the vaccine? When can we have the vaccine? Uh, are we going to have the vaccine next year? Uh, or, you know, so, and, and now we have, uh, you know, over a uh, hundred vaccine developers rushing, uh, racing to develop vaccine and several of them actually in the phase three. But if you look at, we recently analyzed all of them, but if you look at all of them, what you see is that, you know, they are not overnight vaccine developers. You know, it doesn't come up like, there's a COVID, let's develop some vaccine. It doesn't work that way. They have been supported, mostly through public funding and taxpayer monies, 
to working on this area, this related area, for decades, if not more. So many of the so the many of the thinking here is to think about you know well. Uh, anywhere outside of science, things, things fall, happens very, very quickly. In science, the real insights, it takes time. It is slow and many times without any return. But if it has a return, hopefully it's going to be enormous. So, and that's partly why I think it was very important for us to pursue this kind of a wild idea of this new initiative is to think about, you know, if we can actually create another Marie Curie, uh, help another Marie Curie to uh, 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 thrive, that's gotta be worth, you know, a million times more than, you know, people like me. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, I am looking at the time and I, I have so many questions. I will send you the, all, all, all the questions and all the comments so you can see them at the end. But I'm afraid that we are coming uh, a bit uh, at, uh, at, at the end. There's, a, there's a, just a quick one, if I can give me a very, very short answer. Someone is asking, uh, how do you think this will impact the, like the, the COVID, the disruption, looking in terms of innovation, the field of education and learning? This is what I'm interested to, given that that's the field that we are. Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, my, many people have argued what COVID is doing is a progress accelerator, right? Many things don't happen for a decade, but all of a sudden decades of progress happen overnight. You know, in education, for example, we're undergoing this dramatic uh, transition into online learning experience, which for many, many years we have been dragging our feet. But now it's a grand experiment that uh, you know our school has been doing. As far as I can, I understand uh, in the spring quarter it was very, very successful, uh, and we also learned a tremendous amount. And uh, you know, I think you know it fundamentally changes the entire landscape right now. And obviously, again, it depends on where you are in the education. I think the preliminary uh, evidence suggests K through 12 versus the college education or the postgraduate education, they're all different. They're affected very differently. So you have to treat them differently as well as uh, depends on how the situation evolves as we go forward in terms of pandemic. And I love that you answer with that. We are running out of time, but to me that is the perfect ending because I've been saying that I do I'm I am convinced that this disruption, this crisis actually gave a chance to Kellogg to really shine as a place which is incredibly innovative and agile and uh, therefore being able uh, to show you dashing and seeing exactly the kind of thing is thinking, I hope uh, make us all uh, even more excited about the future that we have at Kellogg. Thank you Dashon. it's been incredible, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, thank you all joining us today. And thank you all uh, for joining and uh, you know, let's keep in touch and I hope I'll be able to bring more about all the exciting research we are doing at Kellogg. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Actually, no, day. Have a nice day. You're early in the morning. <laughs> Thank you.